All right, you can turn in your Bible to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, continuing our study here, expository study of the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, last week we did 1 Timothy, chapter 1. Now we're doing 1 Timothy, chapter 2. Um, so we'll start out here in verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. <sighs> now this is going to be a very difficult question to ask because I am convicted about it myself. When's the last time you prayed for Obama? Oh boy. <laughs> uh, doesn't it say there that you're to make supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks for all men? For all that are in authority. Now Obama's, Obama is not the king of America. In spite of what he thinks. You know. But the fact is. We're supposed to pray for him. Why? Well it says there that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. In all godliness and honesty. Now. What happens if the government goes bad? See it said about godliness and honesty. What happens if the government goes bad? All right. Is it ever right to deceive the deceiver? Well, let's look at Romans chapter 13. You can turn there in your Bible. You see, the King James Bible is very good at defining uh, certain things. And a lot of people have this notion that, you know, you should just submit to the government and Romans chapter 13 teaches that. Uh, no, actually it doesn't. Romans chapter 13 teaches something very specific here, which we're going to look at. Romans 13, verses 1 through 5. It says here, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now most apostate hireling phallus houses I've been in, I'm talking about independent fundamental Baptist church buildings, most of them will skip the next two verses and go right to verse 5. They'll tell you, you submit to the government no matter what. That's not what the Bible teaches. Verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. So, who are the rulers that you're supposed to submit to according to the King James Bible? Good rulers. They're not a terror to good works, but to the evil. So your King James Bible defines the kind of rulers that you're supposed to submit yourself to. You're not supposed to just blindly submit yourself to anything that a ruler says. Okay? If Obama comes out and says, I require, I don't like uh, Christian men. So from now on, any man who has, you know, that's, that's married, say my wife and I here, and, and she becomes with child, and the child is a, is a young boy, uh, Obama passes law and says, no Christian young boys are allowed to be born anymore. And if a boy comes out, then you kill him. You have an abortion, in other words. Forced abortion. Would you submit to that? You say, yes, because I am an loyal American. Well, you're rather stupid if you do. Okay? And you say, well, could you give me an example of where this had happened in the past? I was hoping you'd say that. Turn back in your Old Testament to Exodus chapter 1. There is actually a uh, section of your King James Bible there that actually goes through this very scenario. That the ruler, the man in authority, actually was telling the Hebrew women to forcibly abort the male Hebrew babies. Let's look at this. Exodus chapter 1 verse 15. It says here, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shipra, and the name of the other Puah. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, 
and see them upon the stools. If it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. See? Forced abortion. Now, according to some of the brethren out there, according to some of these hirelings in these phallus houses, I was going to say other adjectives there, but, you know, I won't, I'll refrain myself. But uh, according to some of these hirelings, you should submit to that. Because the Pharaoh was the supreme ruler, and you do what the supreme ruler tells you to do. Uh-uh. Continue on here. Look at verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. See? Hey, you're forced to get an abortion. Sorry, my God says no. Hey, you're forced not to speak against sodomy. How dare you speak against sodomy? That's a hate crime. Sorry, but the Bible says it's, a, it's an abomination. Sorry. I'm going to follow God and not you, Obama. I'm going to pray that Obama stays off of my back, stays off of our back. I'm going to pray for the guy and say, keep him busy with this serious stuff and keep him busy with all these other things and all these decisions and stuff. Just make his life a miserable wreck so that we can keep preaching the word. That's what we're supposed to do, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. But what happens if it gets, if the tyranny gets so bad? Then you obey God and not man. Continue on here, verse 18. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? Okay. See? The king knew what they were doing. The pharaoh there, he knew what they were doing. And he calls them in and he says, Why'd you do this? You disobeyed me. Now remember what it said there in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2, verse 2. It says about lead a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, what would be the honest thing for those Hebrew women to say to Pharaoh? They should have said, well, Pharaoh, you're probably not going to like this very much, but the fact is we fear God more than we fear you, and we're not going to submit ourselves to you. But you know what that would have done? Pharaoh would have said, take these women out and kill them. Kill them. That's what he would have done. So how did the Hebrew women answer? Verse 19, And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Isn't that interesting? Now, come on. You know, there might be some differences between the Egyptians and the Hebrew women, but the fact is, don't tell me that these, the midwife is on her way and all of a sudden she gets there, oh, the baby's already been born. Oh, there's another one. He was born before we got there too. What did they do? They lied to Pharaoh. They deceived. They see they couldn't live in honesty anymore. Go back to Nazi Germany. The Nazis come to your door, you know, here comes the Gestapo. Bam, bam, bam. Slams on your door. You come to the door and they say, do you have any Jews in your home? We're here to take them to the concentration camps. Yes, I have a whole family down in my basement. Go ahead and take them. And oh, oh by the way, I've been saving up some, some gold and silver coins and that's up under my bed, my mattress. You know, you probably ought to take that too. And uh, what else could I be honest with you about? No. You deceive the deceiver. They're tyrants. They're coming in at that point and saying, you need to do this and you need to do that. And you say, well, wait, the Bible says, no, don't do those things. So I'm going to follow the Bible before I follow these sinful men. But look here at God's reaction. These Hebrew midwives just lied to their political leader. Now, does God come down and say, you really shouldn't have done that. I'm ashamed of you for lying to your political leader. Look what the Lord does. Verse 20. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. How about that? Verse 22, And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Did they do it? No. They could have cared less about Pharaoh's little decree that he passed. You know, Obama comes out and he says, you will get health care. You will go and sign up for these programs. You will sign up for the government, do this and that and stuff and whatever. And Christians just should, should look at that and go, no. The government has no right educating you or educating your children. The government has no right to tell you what you can and cannot do with the body that God has given you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God 
owns your body, not the secular government. They have no right. Are you 501c3? Did you go to the government and get permission before you read your Bible this morning? How dare you read your Bible without the government's permission? Pfft, you know, wrong. Sorry. I don't need the government's permission over me to tell me what I can and cannot say in the ministry. All right? I don't need the government to say you need to have a permit to preach. I don't need the government to tell me anything to do that I'm supposed to do according to the Bible. Sorry. Go away from me. And I'm going to tell you a story, you know, uh, in a, another video here. I'm not sure when I want to record this. I might, you know, put it up before I even put this sermon out. But the fact is, I had a government man, a military man, talk to me about a gospel tract. And I don't need to tell him all the details. See? Watch out for that teaching that just says, blind submission to the government. The government in America, and in the UK, and in Australia, and in a bunch of other places, the governments have way overstepped their bounds. The government in Scripture is given for the punishment of evildoers, both foreign and domestic. The American government is supposed to be there to protect our borders. If there's somebody over in another country that's threatening our country, okay, go to war with them. But they should protect our borders, and they should enforce the laws of this land. If there's some guy going out killing, killing children or something like that, going through a neighborhood, send the police after the guy. Okay? That's fine. But when the government starts to come in and they start to get into education, and they start to get into Christian fellowships, the church, and they start to get into your health, they've overstepped their bounds, and you have a right and a duty to disobey them, just like the Hebrew midwives did in the Bible. And you know what will happen? The Lord will reward you for it. Did you know if you go and just blindly submit yourself to the government's medical system, you know what you're going to have? You're going to have poor health. You know what happens if you go and you submit yourself to the government's educational system? You're going to have poor health education. You're going to have government brainwashing. See, whenever you submit yourself to the secular government in an area where they don't have a right to be, in an area that God is the authority, you're going to fall apart. And if you go to a 501c3 church, you're out of the will of God. I'll tell you that right now. God cannot bless a church where the pastor is silenced by the IRS. Where the pastor stands up when it's time to elect somebody and he goes, I can't t tell you who to vote for because I'm not allowed to because I would violate my 501c3 status and I don't want to do that. Not a legitimate church. Okay? Jesus Christ is the head of the church, not the IRS, not the secular government, and definitely not Obama. So what you do is you pray for Obama, all right? That God keeps him busy so he stays away from us. And I thank the Lord for the freedom that we still have here in America. Yes, it's being eroded quickly. But there's still a lot of militant Christians in this country that are warring a good warfare, as we read about there in the last chapter last week. And the Lord is keeping the doors open. Praise the Lord. I'm glad for that. But the, the, the more Christians get yellow and get cowardly and start to back off and start to compromise, the more evil we're going to see come into this nation. Don't back down. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. You can go back there. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Okay, it says here, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's interesting because salvation in your King James Bible is always linked to acceptance of the truth. You're never going to have somebody who is saved and just living total lies and, and total, total error. Why is that? John chapter 14, 6. You ought to know this by heart. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, Jesus said. Okay? Jesus Christ is truth personified. So you get a Christian, professing Christian, and they hate the truth. They don't want anything to do with the truth. You try to give them facts. You try to give them, show them proof of something. And they're just like, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. And you say, what do you believe? And they believe error. They believe lie. They believe deception. 
nine times out of ten you're dealing with either somebody well nine times out of ten you're dealing with a false convert and the only other person it could be is somebody that just recently got saved and they are just at the very beginning and they're totally green they don't know anything yet you know but if you get somebody that's saved for 30 40 50 years they say and they hate the truth they're lost <laughs> they are so lost okay you say prove it okay turn to second thessalonians chapter 2 keep your hand there in first timothy chapter 2 we'll go to second thessalonians chapter 2 these are some good verses here second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10 through 12 and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved you say that just has to pertain to jesus christ well if you study the Jesus Christ, even if even if that were true, which I don't believe that, but if even if it were true that it was only the truth of Jesus Christ, you study the Jesus Christ of the modern Christians, it's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. The Jesus Christ of the modern Christian, most of them, he's this loving, hippie, tree-hugging, peaceful, just wonderful guy that never judges anybody. He's okay with sodomites, and he's okay with rock music, and he's okay with all these things. You're dealing with the Antichrist, okay? That's who the modern Christians worship. They don't worship Jesus Christ of the Bible. Okay? Continuing here, verse 11. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Okay? And again, we can see there in verse 4, turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 there, it says about that uh, we'll have all men to be saved you know not just the few chosen elect of calvinism so again calvinism is a stupid system anytime you have a system that's named after a man you want to avoid it like the plague okay unless it's jesus christ you know i don't mind calling myself a christian all right i'm just not going to call myself a calvinist or a lutheran or a or a wesleyan or you know mennonite or something like that okay First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Sorry to the Catholics, Mary is not the mediatrix. It's not God, Jesus, Mary, Catholic priest uh, the, that's a pedophile, and then the people. Uh-uh, no, sorry. One mediator. You can go to God directly through Jesus Christ. All right, you pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. All right, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Don't forget that. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Okay, Jesus Christ is the one that gave himself a ransom for all. Oh, you mean all of the elect? No, I mean all. Okay. And it'll be testified in due time, by the way. All these people, these vile, wicked atheists, and these, you know, the ones that are knowing atheists, not the ones that were raised in a communistic system. You know, I was corrected on that, and that's a good point. You know, there are people that are raised without understanding the Bible, without whatever. So they're technically an atheist, but it's like communism. You know, I'm not talking about people like that. I'm talking about these atheists here in America that hate God, hate the Bible, hate Christians. You know, those are the people there. It's going to be testified in due time. All right, we're going to get to see every single atheist that's ever lived stand before God and have to bow down before God and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's going to be fun. Great White Throne Judgment. Richard Dawkins comes up, bows down. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay, down into hell, lake of fire. Ah! There he goes, burning down there, screaming forever. Sorry, you had your chance. Continuing on. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Does it say there that pray, you know, only when times get bad? No. And again, here's some conviction coming uh, to me as, as well because my prayer life isn't always what it should be. 
There are many times I don't pray as much as I should. But uh, do you pray with wrath and doubting? Look at James chapter 4. Turn to James chapter 4. You know, a lot of times people will make you mad in this life and you can pray with wrath and doubting. Let's look here. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says here, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot, cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. When you pray, are you praying for God to strike people down? Are you praying, that guy wronged me, and I pray, Lord, you just take care of that guy, and that's stinking, uh, you know. Hey, if somebody's wronged you, forgive, forget, move forward. You know, you can spend time, brethren, wasting your time worrying about this situation, worrying about that situation. Don't. <laughs> just forget about it. All right? Be angry, sin not. You know, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Forget about it. Move forward. You have a life to live for Jesus Christ. You have treasures to lay up in heaven. All right? You have bitterness, things that have happened to you in the past, horrible things. You know, get rid of that bitterness. It's just going to ruin you. All right? But you see, there's a lot of people that pray. And again, like the last study, we read about, you know, being tossed with the wind and wavering, going back and forth. You know, you don't want to do that. Okay? When you pray, you should have faith that the Lord's going to take care of that situation. Now, the Lord doesn't mean the Lord's going to say yes every time that you pray and ask Him for something. But the fact of the matter is, you should pray and just say, Lord, have thine own way. And the Lord, when you, when you give your life over to the Lord and you say, I want you to have your way, Lord. I want you to have your will in my life. The Lord will do the right thing every time. Okay? But when you pray... You shouldn't have wrath and doubting in that prayer. When you pray, just say, Lord, I believe you're going to do the best thing for me. Help me to trust you. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Okay, it says here, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety not with broided hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Okay, now let me make a point here. These verses are not condemning broided hair, or wearing gold, or pearls, or costly array. It's not saying that you're not to do those things. Because if it did, then you could just simply look and you could say, well, it condemned gold, but it doesn't condemn silver. It condemn pearls, but it doesn't condemn diamonds or rubies or sapphires or whatever. See, you know, it says broided hair, but I could get my hair, you know, permed or something like that. See, you know, you could get by it if it was just condemning those things. You know, what it's condemning, what it's saying there is, your beauty is not supposed to come from your outward appearance. All right? If you're a woman, your beauty should come from your godly life of good works your shamefacedness, and your sobriety. Not from your outward appearance. That's where it should, should come from. Okay? And having said that, you need to realize something as a woman. Your appearance can cause men to sin. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28 says, Ye have heard that it has, was said by them of old time that thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whatsoever Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Okay? If you're a Christian woman and you're dressing inappropriately, and you know when you're dressing inappropriately too, by the way, don't give me this stuff of, you know, I didn't know. You know, if you're wearing pants that are tight and showing off parts of your body that shouldn't be showing off, you know, and you're wearing a low-cut top or a tight top or something like that, you know when you're dressing that way. And if you're causing men to sin, you're causing men to commit adultery in their heart with you. You need to think about that. And by the way, while I'm on the subject, this doesn't often get talked about. And I've been rebuked on this a few times myself. People say, well, you talked about women, you didn't talk about men. 
Okay, now I'll talk about men. There are certain ways that you can dress as a man that also elicits attention. You see, women can wear tight jeans, but so can men. Women can wear clothing that reveals parts of their body, so can men. And if you're a man and you're walking around and you have some pretty good muscles and stuff like that, and you're wearing a muscle shirt, and you're causing women to lust, you know, you're also in sin. It's not right. The Bible talks mostly about women having to dress modestly. That's because back then in the first century, women were a whole lot more proper than women today. Okay? Even if a hundred years ago, women a hundred years ago wouldn't have thought and done the things that women do today. You know, there are women today that will initiate fornication with men. Not a hundred years ago. You know, even the most seedy harlot a hundred years ago would not have been going out and laying and getting all over men and stuff like that. Women do it all the time now, including professing Christians, you know. Yeah, sure. Things have changed for the worse. But if you're a man, you need to think about that. There are women out there that, that have lust problems, that have pornography problems just as much as a man. And if you're dressing in ways that is bringing the wrong kind of attention, you're going to answer for that. Be careful. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Let the, women, or let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay, what do you have there? Silence? What is that? Shamefacedness. Shamefacedness means bashfulness. It means a woman who is quiet. What about subjection? You know, with all subjection? There, what's that? Sobriety. A woman who is sober, who is in control of her emotions, who is not acting like she's a fool or something like that, not going around, ah, 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 and just acting weird. Not supposed to be that way. You are supposed to, as a Christian woman, you are supposed to have shamefacedness and sobriety. Okay? And you are to learn in silence with all subjection. That's when the saints all get together. Okay? When the assembling of the saints happens there. That doesn't mean if you're sitting at home with your husband, and, he's, and you're going through the Bible, you're having family devotions or something, that you're just supposed to sit there. You know, no, you can ask questions. We're going to see that as we continue here. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. It says here, let your, woman, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Okay, what you have there is you have the church in that reference there. Again, context, read the context. Okay, this is not giving justification for a church building. What this is saying is when the church all comes together, Paul's rebuking the Corinthians in, in chapter 14 because when they're all coming together, they're acting like a bunch of fools. All right? And he's saying, hey, when that church comes together, let the women be silent. All right? And if they are going to learn anything, let them ask their husband at home, which puts a great responsibility on the husband, doesn't it? You say, well, uh, I don't have to worry about it because I have a paid hireling, uh, I mean a uh, <coughs> pastor. Excuse me. And I pay his good salary, and he's got a nice building, and he has a PhD and a THD and a THM and what other other little things. You know, I pay his good salary. He's, he teaches us everything. No, there, buddy. It's your job to know the Bible, and it's your job to be a strong spiritual leader. You say, well, what if I don't have that as a wife? Well, you should have thought of that before you married. And if you say, well, I got married as a lost woman, and then I got saved, and I have a husband who's lost. You know, I've had a number of women written, you know, wrote that to me. Well, then you need to pray. You need to pray hard that God will save your husband because you need that spiritual headship there. All right? Very important. But um, let's continue on here. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And by the way, let me say this too. There it says about, nor do you usurp authority over the man. There is no position on this earth 
that a woman should take where she is in authority over the man. You say, like what? Military? I think it's disgusting. It's, it's comical to see these female drill instructors and they're going, you know, attention! And yelling and stuff like this. What a joke. Give me a break. Women shouldn't be in the military. How about female politicians? Nope, sorry. You say, well, I have a bunch of, of men that are under me at my job because I'm a supervisor. Again, you're wrong. You're to be a keeper at home. You say, I don't really know if I agree with it. Okay, then your contention is here. It's not here. All right, if you can find me some scripture that says I'm wrong, okay, then I'll submit to what you have to say. All right? But till then, I'm going to stick with the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 says, For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, a lot of people, when they read there in Genesis, you know, chapter 3, uh, when they read that, they actually will read that thing, and they'll think that Adam and Eve were both deceived. But the Lord showed through Paul here that it wasn't so. Adam knew what his wife did, and he chose to accept the penalty of death along with her. See, and that's something that you're going to have to do a lot of times if you're the husband. You're going to see if when your wife messes up on something, you're going to have to accept the penalty with her. Okay, why? You're tied to her, you're married. Two bodies, but one flesh. Hmm. But you see there, the woman being deceived was in the transgression. You see, God made women to be more sensitive so that they could do a better job of raising the children. And that sensitive nature, a lot of times, will cause her to be more trusting than a man. And that's what happened with Eve. Satan didn't come to, to Adam and say, Hey, Adam, why don't you eat a little bit of this fruit here? You know, uh-uh, he didn't do that. He came to Eve when Adam wasn't there. Watch out about that. Hey, husbands, you better be real careful who your wife listens to. And if you find your wife listening to men like, uh, what's the guy, uh, who? Chuck Colson, or uh, what's the, what's the uh, uh, 700 Club guy? Pat Robertson, Pat Robertson, Billy Graham, uh, Rick Warren, Joe Osteen, any of these guys. If you hear him listening, or you hear your wife listening to some guy like that, or even some of the Baptist pastors, you better be real careful, and you better filter what is getting to your wife, because Satan will go after your wife, and he'll try to get your wife messed up so she'll mess up you. And you'll have to pay the penalty with her. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Notwithstanding, in other words, the Lord's not saying women are dirty, they're rotten, they're stupid, they're good for nothing. Uh-uh. It says, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Okay? Now you say, wait a second here. Is a woman saved by having children? Any woman that gets saved or that, that has children, then she is automatically saved? Is that what the text is saying? No. What, is, what it's saying there in context is Satan will go and deceive her, but she can be saved in childbearing if... She continues in faith, charity, holiness with sobriety. All right, what's going on there? Well, we're going to get ahead of ourselves here a little bit in this study of 1 Timothy, but turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 11 through 15. Okay, it says here, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. It doesn't mean that they lost their salvation. It just simply means the faith there that it's talking about is the faith of Christianity. They cast off that first relationship that they had with the Lord. And so their life becomes like a living hell, essentially. They get damnation. Verse 13, And withal they learn to be idle, oh boy, wandering about from house to house, not only and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, Guide the house, give more occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Wait a second there, I must have missed something. I, I, does your Bible say anything about uh, have a career? 
I didn't, I didn't see it there in verse 14. Um, work outside the home and make more money than her husband? I must have missed that. You know, see? I know that there are situations, you know, people, uh, you know, and stuff, uh, you know, my husband's sick or he can't work or something. And I have to do the working. I know that. Okay. But that's the exception. The fact is, the Bible says, there are your responsibilities. Younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. And women in the workplace, a lot of times there's problems that are happening. Why do you think that the divorce rate is so high? track it. Go back again. This is science. Go back and look at when women started to really enter into the workplace and divorce goes poo through the roof. Why? Women are not supposed to be in the workforce. Why? Your wife is away from you. You don't know where she is. You don't know what she's doing out there. You don't know who she's talking to. It's dangerous. How did Satan deceive Eve? He waited till she was away from Adam. Interesting. Continuing here, verse 15 in 1 Timothy chapter 5. For some are already turned aside after Satan. Interesting. You know, just imagine here for a minute. I know this is going to be kind of difficult because you're going to have to imagine that I'm Eve. You know, but just bear with me. I'd make a very ugly Eve. But uh, imagine here's Eve and she's walking along through the beautiful Garden of Eden and she's walking along do 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 and she's looking at the leaves and she's looking at the pretty flowers and look at the pretty tree there and everything and all of a sudden, oh, hello. And here's this beautiful serpent. And the serpent says, uh, Adam's not around. Hmm, good. Hmm. Hey, uh, hi Eve. You know, how would you like to be wise? You know, I'm one of God's creatures. I'm up there in the throne room and stuff. I know what goes on and everything. Would you like to know good and evil? And she's like, well, sure. That sounds good. Let me teach you, okay? Um, that tree over there, that sure looks like it's good food, doesn't it? You know, here's a tree. You know, look at that. Doesn't that look tasty? Mmm, mmm. Doesn't that look nice? Isn't that good? Take a bite. You know what that is? Poison. These things are poisonous. You don't want to eat them things. But you see, the devil will come along to the woman and he'll say, you don't really have too much going right now. You're not too busy, so you're just kind of idly walking around. And, da, 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 and he gets her. You see, a woman is saved in childbearing because she's busy. She has no time to be idle. All right? There's just no time for that. And there's something else, too. If Eve had had a little child with her, and she'd have been walking out there, and all of a sudden here's a serpent, she'd have been like, what do you want? Get away from me. Adam! 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 See? A woman who has a child is very protective of that child. Okay? That's why the Bible says she shall be saved in childbearing. Now you say, well, what happens if you're a woman and you don't have a child? Well, then you're going to have to work very hard at making sure that you're not idle. Because when you're idle, that's when the devil comes in and gets you. You have to make sure that you have plenty of things to do. All right? Don't just spend all your time on the Internet looking at this guy and listening to that guy and listening to that guy and stuff like that. Do things around the house. Keep yourself busy. Plant a garden. Go for walks. You know, whatever. I mean, do, do things. Keep yourself busy. Go out tracting. Do whatever. You know, if you have the money, maybe you can consider adopting a child if the Lord hasn't blessed you with children. There are things that you can do, in other words. Um, volunteer to, to get fresh air children or something like that. I mean, there's, there's ways that you can keep yourself active. Learn how to crochet. Learn how to sew. Learn how to knit. Do things for the home. Do things for your husband. All right? But be very careful about being an idle woman. All right? Very, very dangerous there. So that's going to be it for the study of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for the fact that we can know that we are saved by reading your word. 
And uh, Lord, I just pray a very special prayer for all the women out there, um, that they would uh, seek to adorn themselves with shame, shamefacedness and sobriety, and that they would learn to learn your word with all subjection and in silence, and uh, that they would seek to keep themselves busy and active for you. And Lord, I pray for the men out there, that they also would dress in modest apparel, that they would think about what they put on, that they don't attract the wrong kind of attention. And also, Lord, I pray if, if the men are saved, uh, they're listening to this study, that they would really consider the fact that they are to be the spiritual head of their wife, not a pastor, not a preacher, um, and that they would really spend some time studying your word. So uh, I just thank you again, Lord, for all that you do for us. And I pray it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that's it for 1 Timothy chapter 2. We'll see you next week with 1 Timothy chapter 3.